welcome to the Crisis of Black Archives. And this is a subject that is very near and dear to, uh, to me and to the two people that I have the pleasure to have on the panel with me today. Uh, one is Howard Dodson. Um, he's the Director Emeritus of the Schomburg uh, Center uh, for Black Research and Culture. Um, he, was, he served in that position for over a quarter of a century from 1984 to 2011. And, um, and I have to also say, um, just out of bias, that um, when I just first started, Howard was the first person uh, that I went to because the Schomburg Library um, had a collection, a large collection of oral history um, interviews. Also with us today is Khalil Jabon Muhammad, Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Radcliffe Institute. He succeeded Howard um, as uh, Director of the Schomburg Library, and he served in that capacity from 2011 to 2015. So it's such a pleasure to have the two of you with us. And um, I want to actually, um, we were just talking about how um, Khalil, you had actually chosen this subject to do uh, when you were director and Howard had been the keynote speaker for the subject. But this, this is, um, I, the area that we wanna talk about today is the crisis of black archives. And I wanna start out by asking uh, both of you and let's take it back to the panel that you had. Why did you do the panel at the time? The, the convening, it's not a panel. This is a panel today, but the convening that you did back then and, and what was your goal when you did the convening? That's a great question, Juliana. And thanks so much for having Howard and me. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, between the two of us, um, we're talking about uh, 35 years of probably the single most important collection uh, of the Black past um, outside of the National Archives. And uh, I was concerned uh, somewhat early in my tenure that what I was seeing in terms of our collections, in terms of the increasing market value uh, for what we might call legacy collections, civil rights icons, uh, artists, activists, people like Harry Belafonte, who of course, whose collection has recently arrived at the Schomburg Center, that an increasing market effect was putting a lot of pressure on the Schomburg Center uh, to be able to archive the second half of the 20th century and to continue to grow. So much, so many of our collections came in for people who were alive in the mid 20th century, but since their passing, uh, it, it was harder. And digitization created additional pressures of both preservation and interpretation. Uh, people who were thinking about the Schomburg Center as a home for collections were also demanding that they be digitized in fairly short order. Uh, for years, it was just about processing or making available to researchers or putting some of the items on display in an exhibition. But digitization, as history maker certainly knows, is incredibly expensive. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, because we were doing this with the Mellon Foundation, uh, I was particularly concerned about the, a broader trend in society at the time. This was during the second term of the Obama administration. That conference took place in about 2013, 14. I have to look back uh, over the exact date. And I was concerned that there was also increasing pressure to dilute the value of Black collections, to dilute um, the autonomy that had come with the Schomburg Center over the years in cataloging Black life, that somehow we were ceding some of the ground of our expertise to uh, call it post-racial archiving ethos of, <laughs> of the period. And I thought that was a bad mistake. One, uh, it was gonna make it harder for the Schomburg to see Blackness in the archives and to keep up with the interpretive trends in Africana studies. Uh, and also I thought it was gonna diminish what we do institutionally. And so my suspicions, I didn't want to be the governing um, approach. I wanted to learn from other people in the field. And so we brought in a national um, community of archivists all around the country, uh, of private and public, of small and large. And we posed these questions to people. And it turns out our suspicions were largely true and the budgetary concerns and digitization concerns and all of that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. I, did you want to say something, Howard? Yeah, just to extend it, um, they, uh, it was a very interesting kind of um, new integration uh, where um, previously they didn't collect anything about the Black experience. We start to build the foundation for it, and suddenly it's time for everybody to do it. But the assumption, as was the case with um, our kind of political integration, was that the Black thing should disappear and, and just be folded into the mainstream thing. And there was no need for us to uh, continue to try to build this separate uh, kind of parallel um, uh, uh, collection. And building the par parallel collection was not just because of the segregation. It was also a necessity to get clarity on the particularity of the African-American experience specifically and the African experience more, uh, more generally. And um, that need, which uh, we made some progress on, uh, is equally as great right now. And a part of the reason why it's so great is that uh, in the final analysis, our reading of the history suggests that um, America will become the America that it proposed to be when the African-American community uh, enjoys the benefits and um, uh, participation in America at a level that's commensurate with um, addressing the needs that the majority of black people face 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so it, it, so there's a, a, both a political dimension to it. There's a kind of um, kind of flowing with the integrationist um, uh, disappearing act of black people, <laughs> which, uh, which, which, which was there uh, really? as well as other factors. It's interesting that you would mention that because uh, we had a music panel as part of this convening and I was struck um, when one of the panelists said, uh, took one of the musicians aside and told a story of being taken aside and said, uh, why are you doing jazz? Isn't that white people's music? Wow. And so this is, it's sort of a prescient view that you're talking about. And I, I want to go back though, um, Howard, to the you know, the Schomburg and its role here in American society, many would consider it the crown jewel of black archives in many ways. And I want to, um, I, I also want to talk about your role there uh, because in many ways um, I view uh, the Schomburg, the Schomburg as we know it today as Howard Dodson Schomburg. Um, I came to the Schomburg knowing Jean Hudson as a young a student um, who was very helpful to me when I was doing research. We know the founder was Otero Schomburg, but I would like you to talk about the Schomburg that you came to uh, when you came there. Um, well, it's very interesting. Uh, the Schomburg Center became a official part of the New York Public Library. Um, emerged initially out of an uh, effort by the librarian in Harlem who said that they needed to have more collections dealing with Black folk because it, in the midst of the Harlem Renaissance, there was more of a demand for that. And Arthur Schomburg chaired a uh, community task force to try to lead the effort to gather that material. Um, that was in 25 and 20, actually started in 24. Uh, in 25, they established what they called the Division of Negro History, Literature, and Prints, uh, which was a special collection of African-American material dealing with the Black experience. And um, a year later, um, through the good offices of the Carnegie Foundation, uh, the, Schomburg, uh, the New York Public Library acquired Mr. Schomburg's collection and negotiated a deal to bring it into the Harlem branch. Now the collection was officially acquired by the New York Public Library Central. Uh, budgetarily and all the rest of that, it was originally part of the New York Public Library, but it was a specific request of Mr. Schomburg that it be placed in the 120, uh, 135th Street branch so it would be easily accessible to the African-American community. Well, the New York Public Library didn't treat it as though it was a part of the New York Public Library. It didn't get adequate funding. 
uh, and a number of other things that um, by the mid er, by the early 1970s, um, the Schomburg Center was actually, or the Schomburg Collection at the time it was called, was in uh, a, a pretty serious state of um, deterioration. Uh, with inadequate budgets and inadequate staff and other kinds of things like that, it simply was not able to function. Well, there was a movement uh, in the late 60s, early 70s that started some of it having to do with the emergence of African American studies uh, and, and black studies as a field that got the New York Public Library to look at the branch again and start redoing and expanding the support and services that came with it. And during Jean Blackwell Hudson's um, uh, tenure, um, she was able to identify a federal source to fund the construction of the red brick building that's there. And that was going on, uh, that was completed, um, I guess about a year before I ended up going to the Schomburg, which would have been around 83. And uh, in that context, two things were going on. There were um, efforts being made to preserve a lot of the neglected material that was there so that when it moved into the better, uh, the new building, it would be better organized. And uh, there were efforts uh, being made to rethink the organizational structure of the, uh, of the new center. Um, they had formal divisions established based on format or they had started doing that. And they moved along from that point on. Um, trying to increase the number of people on staff and otherwise to bring it somewhere close to standard. I came in in the midst of that, uh, that process. And um, as fate would have it, I came in the, in the midst of their planning for a, um, the largest at the time uh, capital campaign in the history of the New York Public Library. And when I got there, they had the plan all laid out basically uh, for this million dollar campaign and something like, um, I think two, uh, $2.5 million had been set aside to be raised at the end of the campaign to support the Schomburg. Well, uh, I wouldn't have that. And we ended up actually getting a uh, campaign going that was more commensurate with the needs. And we kind of, uh, kind of pushed from there. But Howard, I wanna, I wanna ask, I want you to talk about the collections that you brought in and why I, I referenced you that way, because they're significant collections. And I would like you to tell some of the stories around some of those collections. And I'm talking about the James Baldwin, the Malcolm X, Maya Angelou. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, uh, um, with this preface. Um, what I found when I arrived at the Schomburg was that uh, the kind of um, if you will, collecting philosophy that Arthur Schomburg and other bibliophiles of the early 20th century had uh, used to build their collections was still the dominant um, uh, kind of collection approach uh, in the field. And uh, a lot of it was book centric uh, with a, a major focus on getting the historic books, the, the, the rare books on the black experience that were not uh, held it by, by the general public, Be beginning with that and then building out to newspapers and um, other objects, but there was, it, it was not, it, it, in, in many respects, it was linked to the concept of history that people had at the time. So you had materials on great black um, heroes and sheroes. You had uh, materials that would, books that would show that black people were um, uh, in the American Revolution, in the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you had all, all of those kinds of things, but that kind of, uh, if you will, collection development framework, uh, quite frankly, had been surpassed uh, by the kind of work that was being proposed for the field of black studies. And so my um, approach was to work with our curators of each of our divisions to try to develop a collection development agenda for each division that was linked to the emerging fields of scholarship. And most importantly, shifting from um, a primary focus on secondary material to primary research material. 
and primary research material being um, the original papers of organizations of individuals, et cetera, um, the uh, original objects of art um, and music and uh, sound recordings, et cetera, um, photographs, major building of the photographic collection, et cetera. Building these things around subjects that we, in consultation with scholars, we had identified as priorities for the research in these fields going forward. And so we uh, set up that kind of strategy. And uh, in the context of that, we were able to go after and target specific individuals, specific uh, organizations, et cetera, that we wanted to bring into the collection rather than depend on a kind of volunteerist um, approach where people would just call and say they had this and or they had a, a storage problem and wanted to dump it, dump it at the Schomburg. We uh, be, uh, developed a very high degree of intentionality in how we would go about uh, defining the collections that we needed to acquire and building the capacity to do that, both in terms of money and in terms of organizational structure. Each of the divisions was set up to handle the specific preservation needs of each of the formats of material that we uh, that we use. Okay, Howard, but tell me about how those collections came. Well, the the, the uh, having said we had all of that uh, kind of strategy and, and, and et cetera in place does not mean that uh, everything that we acquired was a result of our uh, you know kind of um, institutional genius <laughs> and our our institutional uh, uh, you know. Uh, commitments. We still had these, um, I get circumstantial things that I, I'll, I'll mention this uh, as an example. Um, you mentioned the Baldwin collection. It actually uh, just came in about a year or so ago. But at the time that um, the Jimmy um, um, Jimmy left, Jim, <laughs> Jimmy came to the Schomburg Center for the Christmas party for my staff. Um, just before the Christmas holidays. And um, he had just uh, negotiated a deal. He had been commuting between Paris and the University of Massachusetts for years. And he decided he was going to uh, try to work, get a, a position in, uh, in New York. He got a commitment from uh, NYU. And he had just basically kind of signed the, um, uh, the contract to come to the NYU. And, um, that was on like a Friday. He ended up going out um, that week. We ended up going out that weekend and uh, he got a call from St. Paul de Vence and had to go back to France. Got there, took sick, uh, died, never made the return trip. His um, secretary um, was, a, was a fellow that I knew and he was still in the States. He ended up going, I paid for him to go to uh, St. Paul de Vence to pack up all of Jimmy's stuff <laughs> and ship it back to his house, to Jimmy's house in New York. And they basically put, got the collection uh, organized there and preserved there so that it would not get scattered all over the place, eh? And so that um, we certainly had a, a, a desire to have the collection be a part of the Schomburg. And Jimmy had said to me that that's what he wanted, but we didn't have anything on paper that said that. Well, a bunch of years went by before uh, we were eventually able to bring that collection to the uh, to the Schomburg. But it started with a, a, a preservation act on our part, um, taking responsibility, having a sense of responsibility for the uh, significance and value of that collection, and not letting it um, through circumstance end up being scattered to the four winds or otherwise. Uh, having problems. We had an interesting other one with um, Alex Haley. And uh, Alex's brother decided uh, that he was the executive of this, this state. And he concluded that there was, um, it, it, Alex had too many bills. And the only thing that he had that had any monetary value was the collections. And so he put it up for auction. And um, this is a good, a good news, bad news story. <laughs> uh, he ends up uh, putting it up for auction. Uh, we gather up some money to go and get into the auction because it's going to be sold. 
we buy a significant part of it, but no, nowhere near what we should have acquired in a more, I, I tried very hard to get him to keep the collection together and sell it to us. He wouldn't do it, he wanted it on auction. Um, we got a portion, but the rest of the collection was scattered to the four winds and that collection will never be reassembled again. And uh, for someone working on Alex uh, Haley, I mean, if there were individuals who were buying stuff, there were libraries that were buying and it basically was on a lot by lot basis being sold off, which is bad news. Um, I, I wanna, but that, I wanna, I wanna you know, go it, back to a little basic here. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanna, Cleo, I want to ask you to define or let our audience know what papers mean. Because, you know, often I'm talking about papers where people don't have a clue what I'm talking about, and it's a colloquial term. So can you define, can you um, define papers for us, for our audience? Sure. So in, in archival collections, they're usually organized by, uh, by the medium itself. So everything from physical paper uh, to photographs to moving image, uh, sound, all these things have been historically categorized by the medium. And so when we talk about papers, what we mean by that are printed materials uh, that are unpublished, that are often private, uh, anything ranging from a diary to correspondence. Sometimes the letter writer uh, keeps a copy of the letter sent out. Most archival collections have more material of what someone received because people you know, don't necessarily back in the day mimeograph what they wrote. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to see the actual exchange. You have to interpret it from what's in the letter that the uh, person whose papers you've collected uh, actually receives. Uh, it includes, of course, newspaper clippings. You know, all of us are uh, pack rats in our own in our own ways. Scrapbooks uh, that are sometimes professional, often personal, sometimes a mix of the two. Uh, it includes um, other kinds of citations and accomplishments that people have. And of course, a traditional collection representing a life has multiple formats. Uh, so of course, there will be those photographs, as I mentioned, cassette tapes uh, and video or hard drives. And, and going into the future, of course, we, we already see thumb drives, but you know, people will have cloud storage uh, sites that are part of the legacy. For example, Dropbox or Google Drive. Archivists today have to figure out uh, how to make that material part of the collection because that's where most people's um, material rests and resides and will continue to be so. So when we talk about papers, we really mean the written and visual record of a life and usually a life captured uh, sometime between early adulthood and, and one's passing. And, and often those productive years, if they're a creator, if they're a politician, if they're an everyday person whose life is somehow revealing of greater truths of a moment, um, then it's usually somewhere between 30 years old and, and 60 year old that we see in these collections. Uh, I think for people listening to this broadcast, um, you cannot take for granted that what's in that material means something to future researchers. I'll give one quick example. While I was there, we acquired a collection of SNCC records, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, because archivists are often thinking about like and like, this made sense for the Schomburg Center uh, because we already are home to Ella Baker's papers and we have uh, lots of other intersecting collections that capture the story of the civil rights movement. Uh, so this was a no brainer. Uh, but they're financial records. And in some ways you might think like, hmm, that's not that interesting. It's not that sexy. They're not gonna be entries that are revealing of the, the mind of uh, Bob Moses, for example, or, or Fannie Lou Hamer when they're making decisions about how to organize sharecroppers uh, in, in Mississippi. But it turns out that what's in those records is revealing because everyone knows that no social movement succeeds without money. And money is often a barrier to success, even something as simple as being able to produce propaganda or other kinds of informational material, but also bail money. And so what's in these records is the story of the activists and the correspondence between them and the fiduciaries, whether they were foundations or clerks in the office of SNCC, um, saying, hey, you know, this is how much this costs. Could I get my money? I can't pay my rent. I had to spend my extra money on gas. We had to do a detour because the Klan was on our trail. And it's just fascinating. And it's also very instructive 
uh, as people write about these stories because future social movement activists will need to understand precisely the relationship between what kinds of activism gets funded um, and so, you know, I could go on and on about the richness of that collection, but that's just one example. So even something like your own financial records tell us something about the time and the effort and energy and work that it takes to be able to, to make things happen. I, you know, I, um, th you touch upon th this subject is really sort of important. It's the, the definition of what people are interested in and, um, and what archives are interested in. So you were touching upon the whole thing of, you know, there are, collections or our repositories decide what is priorities or what they are interested in. So not every repository is interested in the same thing. I do want to go back to the, the this whole thing of the crisis that we have because I started to realize probably maybe about a decade ago, because we're oral history projects. So when I would interview someone, you know, I would tell them um, that you know, ask them what they were doing with their papers. And, um, but ask, you know, say that we were oral history and, you know, and try to make some suggestions about where people should, you know, should put their papers. And then I started to see that there was really very, very few. Um, I wanna say a fraction of 1%, but a real on the small end of the fraction that were, had any plans or were even thinking and really, you know, didn't sometimes think anything was important. And I want, um, so that was of concern to me. The other thing is that, and I just wanna put some of these subjects out here so we can have a discussion about this or have your feedback. So that was, that was a concern. Um, but since that time, there are several things that have happened. When I went to Princeton Archives, um, they had no black people. Now they have Toni Morrison, but they had no black people in the archives. They had papers. They showed me John Rogers' student paper, you know, because everybody has to do a paper at Princeton as a student. Yeah. Um, the other thing is there was one college uh, that I don't you know, want to name, but you know, I, it was me and my staff and we were visiting the archives and, you know, I asked them what they had and the archivist said, oh, you know, we don't have anything. And then like a light bulb was off in her head and she's like, but we've got the largest collection of black sample. And so I, um, there are, there, there has been also efforts on our part, Cleo, you know, to, uh, draw attention to this subject and to bring together both historically black colleges and uh, predominantly white institutions who said that they wanted to help. And in one case, I even had, um, had gotten um, the HBCU to agree, um, even though they weren't trusting, they shared collections and to not at the point um, where they have a very large collection that already had it processed but they, they reneged, they wouldn't, they wouldn't digitize, even though they said that they really wanted to help the poor HBCU. So I, I, want, I put that out there to say, um, how much of a crisis do we have now? Let me, let me speak to your first one. Um, one of the, uh, one of the facts of the matter is that um, most of our people, uh, including those that are you know, rising in society, et cetera, um, don't think that their lives, they, they say that they're, they, they feel that they're important, but they don't think that they're important enough to preserve <laughs> or, or, or to document. And um, so they, they go through, um, um, their, their professional lives uh, really not paying very much attention to the record of their work, um, frequently leaving them at the institution that they, that they worked in, uh, et cetera, and, and they're scattered all over the place. So that, that's one phenomenon. And, and just to illustrate that it's not just an individual thing, um, when we did an assessment of the Schomburg's collection, uh, we turned, determined that there were uh, as much as we had of other aspects of the African-American experience, there was very, very little there about black religion. 
And black religion really is, uh, there, there's an assumption in African-American history, at, at least for there was, that virtually everything in the black community starts in the black church. But if you try to document that in the collections of the Schomburg at the time, uh, there wasn't an evidentiary base to say that that was either true or false. And so we ended up doing a preservation of the black um, religious heritage project and uh, was able to get money from a Lilly Endowment for about five years. Uh, we developed this brilliant scheme of going around and collecting records from the churches uh, if they were prepared to give them. And if they weren't ready to give them up yet, we had a microfilm um, machine that we could take to the to the, the church and film everything that was there. Brilliant strategy. We go to the church and ask where the records are, and nobody has a clue. <laughs> then we, after we explain to them what the what records are, they say, "Oh, Miss So and So was the secretary, and she she moved to God knows where, <laughs> and she had some old boxes of and." Basically, the, most of the churches had not been documenting their own history. And some of these institutions, 100, 150 years old. And so we ended up, instead of, uh, in, in many instances, having to run seminars for churches to, for how to assemble collections of the histories and how to uh, set up structures inside their churches so that they, they would be preserved. But that went on for about five years and we filled a significant void in the collection. Still not enough, but there's a, 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 a but a, again, that's true of other, our other organizations um, until the money started showing up on the table. There was no sense of the collections that they, uh, of, of their functioning as organizations had value and what they, um, what gave them value was the notion that there were libraries and archives that were willing to pay for them. Then they started thinking about them in some different kinds of ways. But a lot of our organizations went through the 20th century. Um, the NAACP is, 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 and, and the Urban League are two that actually did attend to preserving their records. But a lot of the others uh, simply did not have a consciousness uh, to do that. And, uh, unfortunately, that's true in a lot of the historically black colleges, which are running, going on 200 years old. So, you know, Howard, when you were just talking, um, places like Emory um, are, um, you know, paying for, for black collections and that sort of changed and made, you know, has made that maybe a more complicated um, situation. But I want Cleo for you to weigh in on what Howard was just saying. Yeah, so I, I want to sort of, point out how so much of what we're calling the crisis of black collections is really a crisis of democracy in the biggest sense. Uh, we just went through an election. We, we just had a crazy four years uh, of Donald Trump. And I think using this analogy to get to your point would be helpful. Uh, before Donald Trump, there was, as I said earlier, this, this tension that maybe black success means leaving black institutions behind. And that uh, that tension between sort of what some of us would call the black public sphere, the place uh, where uh, institutions nurtured the ideas that black people used to be vanguards of democracy. People who felt the weight uh, fascism in America vis-a-vis -vis Jim Crow segregation where, where democracy didn't exist for black people uh, 400 years. Um, and that even after 1965, the struggle for real democracy for black people was an ongoing vigilant act. And so thinking about those black women in South Carolina and the primary and all of the praise for black women showing up in the 2020 election keeps pointing to something that the archives also speak to. And that is that black people generally have over indexed for embodying the best of liberal democratic ideals. And as such, the question of how do you tell and keep telling those stories has run up against this tendency to want to disappear into the fullness of American life 
whereby black collections then are subject to the gatekeeping of predominantly white institutions. They have the money, uh, they have the prestige in ways that matter at the national level, as opposed to the ways that matter within black communities. And sometimes they are line up, sometimes they don't. And what's happened to speak to this point about this crisis is that we saw black elites wanting to be recognized by predominantly white institutions as a measure of their national success I can tell you one of the collections we have, I won't name it, the family member responsible for essentially putting the collection to market said that the person whose life was captured there was bigger than the Schomburg. <laughs> and so as the curator at the time, I had to fight to make the argument within my own institution that it wasn't bigger than the Schomburg and should come to the Schomburg and not disappear on 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue uh, because the person's life should be there as opposed to where the collections that speak to that person's life more directly are. That's real, it's very real. And so the degree to which the kind of moment of uh, black political success before Donald Trump reminded us of how racist this country remained and how important black people are to it meant that um, if Emory wasn't interested in the collection, um, then well, Schomburg couldn't afford to pay for what Emory might have paid for it if they had wanted it. Or if Columbia University or Yale University wasn't interested in it, but um, Schomburg wanted it, but could only afford half of what the dealer was putting it to market for, then they held on to it a little longer, hoping that Columbia or Yale or somewhere else might want it. And the truth is Columbia or Yale, Emory is a little bit of an exception and there are, are there some, some exceptions, but a lot of these places only wanted the creme de la creme, only wanted the elite. And to some degree, no archive is worth its salt if it can't put the high and the low, the middle together meaning that it's the everyday texture of life that has to be part of the story of political elites. This is the work of social history. This is the work that transformed how we see blackness. If it was only about uh, the most um, recognized within the national culture, then we will have missed all of the details. So this crisis means in part that if uh, Harvard University is not interested in genuinely collecting all of its black alumni um, or genuinely interested in building robust collections that capture everything from the everyday banal work of organizing to the exceptional work of black first, then that those collections are being lost because they're not being, they're not coming into the Schomburg or other collections like it in ways that they did in the past. Part of Howard's legacy and part of Jean Blackwell Hudson's legacy, part of Arturo Schomburg's legacy was collecting material whose market value to white people was very little, but whose cultural and political currency to black life was, was priceless. And the shift in that relationship because white people decided to decide who were the greats and we're gonna pay for those greats, but no, nothing else meant that when their budgets dried up or when they just didn't wanna prioritize it, nothing was moving. And so the crisis is that we need more black people to commit to giving to archives that are committed to documenting black life, hard stop, period. And those right. institutions also need support to preserve that material, just like Black churches need support when the tithe and pay comes around and say, we need a new roof, otherwise we won't have a sanctuary. <laughs> I mean, it is existential in that regard. You know, you have an amen corner here with Howard and I. So Howard, you wanna jump in? Cause uh, lots of things were going off in my head right now. Well, I, I, I was just gonna say that um, the, you recall that when um, segregation is finally outlawed, the first thing put on the hit list were black organizations and institutions. Um, and uh, again, if you think about it, the black folk weren't segregating anybody. So why are they the ones who are punished <laughs> to, to correct the nation they are? <laughs> okay. But that, that, that kind of concept is in the back of white America's mind that um, the, uh, the way that you fix white America is essentially to eliminate black folk from it. 
Uh, and short of doing that, you put them in a box that makes them um, basically nothing but an extension of, uh, of their limitations. I'll put it that way. And, uh, and, 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 and the, the, the fact of the matter is that if, if we've done our work well, and if the scholarship that uh, we've been able to uh, have produced over the years um, is in fact um, um, doing its job, uh, we have revealed the degree to which everything that is American rests in some way or another on a black platform. That black folk in, in a, a very real combination, economic and political and cultural sense, have been engines of transformation and change in America that um, it has never been willing to face itself. And in the absence of engaging the African-American experience, you will never understand America. You will never understand America. Well, and, so, and, and, and so getting clarity on the African-American experience is first a uh, responsibility we have to African-American people to have knowledge of, their, of themselves and their role in the past. But it's also foundational for beginning to get at anything approaching the truth, dealing with the American experience. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, I, I, I wanna say that, you know, to people in the audience are gonna say, you know, they're all into archives, you know, so of course they're gonna be passionate about that. But I wanna bring, I wanna bring some of this discussion home because um, the things that, you know, I have learned because this, the state that we're in right now, um, and given, the, um, as Cleo, you said, um, the Donald Trump era, which is not going to end really anytime soon. Um, I, want, I want to bring some of this home with some real examples, uh, because there's a, what is called the um, Army Heritage Center, and they're in charge of all the Army um, museums and the archives. And um, we had um, come to, to um, know them because Togo West, they were interested in Togo West's papers. Togo West's papers had been given to Howard, which was he was an alumnus of. Um, when I started to ask them uh, what they actually, you know, who they had of the Black experience, and they had 25 million for digitization. I want to say that because no one has 25 million. Five million. They had one black person, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. So I can, um, so there's that. The other thing, and I, you know, there are a lot of uh, situations, but I'm going to, I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, so I feel comfortable talking about that law school. Um, and um, they have, uh, there are two black people in the archives at Harvard Law School. Um, one is a, Judge William Hasty, and um, the other is a Professor Clyde Ferguson, um, who had been um, very active um, in the uh, Ugandan time when um, Idi Amin was there. And so that's that's it. And um, and we've been working. I had decided that I was going to take Harvard Law School on as a project. That clearly I could take that two and make it 10. Um, and here I am four years later, and it may be three, they found some small collection, but I've been working with them. But last year, we almost, uh, Charles Ogletree's papers were almost um, destroyed, destroyed, <laughs> discarded with. And mm -hmm. there was a big, we, we acted quickly, and there are now uh, 500 boxes in, um, in Langdale. And, um, and if we go over to the business school, there, there, um, there are three, um, one 1924 graduate, Andrew Brimmer and Dave Thomas, who is now um, you know, president of Morehouse. Um, but there are, I mean, what, I, what I've become increasingly very concerned about is that we need to start now and we have about 10 years, or we're gonna be losing almost all of the 20th century. This is not a joke. 
And I think, you know, we've been having these sessions and um, I'll tell you, you talk about the religious history. Um, uh, Calvin Butts admitted um, in his panel that he really didn't think it was important at one time. He's changed since then. Um, he talked about uh, the tr trunk of, of um, Adam Clayton Powell who left, the trunk left, he says, the, the um, you know, in the Congress to DC, but it never made it to the church. So it was filled with papers. There is like, if we have this small fraction of things that are actually being done, and at the same time, there are no resources. The resources that the larger community, um, and when I say the PWI, say, you know, that they're interested in, they're constantly talking about that they have no money. And if you take, you know, at the Beinecke, they told me that they were basically, you know, interested only in arts and culture of the black community. So where do the scientists go? Where do the medical leaders like Dr. Louis Sullivan, where, 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 do the, where do the lawyers go? You know, where are their repositories? I mean, where are the organizational repositories? I mean, you, Howard, served as um, also um, director of the, of the Howard University archives. And that archive there is amazing and you know that. Um, there are tons of things, the Congressional Black Caucus, their papers are there, but why don't you, uh, you know, can you address that issue? I want both of you, but let's start with you, Howard. The issue of, um... How do I how do I say this? Our crisis. It's our, our crisis. <laughs> it's our crisis. <laughs> we actually um, rose to a level of national consciousness about archives and collecting and that kind of thing in the midst of the, what what I call the the Black Power era, and uh, that came along with the emergence of African American studies as a field and. Uh, its emergence in um, the college and university setting, the academic setting, and all the rest of that. And um, certainly one of a, a piece of the evidence of it coming to light, um, the reprint industry of um, the American press um, ended up coming to the Schomburg to do reprint editions of books that had been published years ago, but had never really, almost never seen the light of day. And so there were these series of books that uh, one could buy, which was your, you know, uh, 150 uh, essential books that you had to have on the black experience at, at colleges and universities and that kind of thing. But the, the, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that we're, um, uh, we as African-Americans are not, sufficiently conscious of our role as history makers. And um, that's not just the case with the elite, it's also the case with the majority of the population. And um, some of that has to do with the notion that history is something made out there that really doesn't really have anything to do with us. Uh, and so that that's a, a I'll, I'll say that that is a, uh, a challenge that we face. Um, and in, in all honesty, the further we've gotten, gotten away from um, that kind of nationalist phase of the African-American experience, the further we've gotten away from a consciousness of ourselves as um, historical actors of some significance. Uh, and therefore people who have the potential to change society and to change the world. We don't that consciousness is not there at the present time. And in, uh, in, in many respects, there's a sense that, um, I say our, Amer our uh, arrival as Americans um, basically killed off our existence as black people um, right. at, at a level of consciousness. Yeah. And, and that, that is a, um, uh, that's a major challenge for us. And it's, it's there uh, from grade school uh, right through the university structures. Um, go ahead, Galen. No, no, no. I, I, I'm going to echo the, your point and, and just use an illustration that I think really gets to this tension. 
uh, because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the one of the lesser known chapters of, of, of American history is the tension between the nationalist and activists within the community pushing for greater expansion of democracy, of racial justice, and the inertia within a community that lives with that oppression, uh, but has been deliberately miseducated out of fighting against it. Mm -hmm. and, and part of fighting against it is also having uh, someone with the resources to open up that space with political education. That's why people like Septa McClark mattered. That's why people like Ella Baker mattered. Um, and so I think about when you talk about Howard University, I think about this you know, incredible conundrum of a place as a singular black institution that produced so many incredible history makers. And yet in the early days of kind of the establishment of of a real infrastructure of black culture, cultural production and social science, you know, Howard University was not a place where African American studies was welcomed. Elaine Locke had to leave Howard University uh, to come to New York City. The Schomburg Center grew out of the orphaned material that historically black colleges were not investing in, even though the material was being produced by their own alumni, like a Du Bois coming out of Fisk University. And so in telling this little bit of an origin story going back a hundred years between our own institutions, not quite sure of what to make of our own greatness and how to archive that greatness, um, follows us to the present where the people who know about archiving, uh, aside from the professionals and the practitioners of it, are activists again. There is so much incredible work of not only capturing the past, by learning from it deliberately within various constellations of what we call the Black Lives Matter movement. But a book was just published called Black Futures, you know, just a couple of weeks ago and, and, and recently reviewed, which is an anthology of the creative and cultural production that is happening right now. But there's a gap between that activist uh, version that the nationalism 3.0, third wave, fourth wave, whatever number we're on right now, and the inertia yet again within the broader community, the kind of people for whom history makers, because of age and because of a certain kind of station in life, um, often articulate a certain kind of ambivalence towards that community. And it's the tension between that younger, often but not always, activist and sometimes nationalist inclined that are pushing and pulling, right? You know, we often hear presidents, including Obama say, make me do it, right? So I think to come full circle, uh, Juliana, to this moment, we need folks to get off their butts and support history makers. There's well, no the reason why, there's no reason why at this point we haven't learned that lesson. I just told a very old lesson, a very old lesson. And it repeats generation after generation. And so if we're gonna learn something from our history, we have to learn that those of us who have arrived at a certain place who feel prideful about our, our place in life have to take the lead from folks who say, we need to know what black folks have been doing because those lessons will help to inspire and teach others uh, going forward. One of the last things I'll say on this, Howard brought in the Maya Angelou collection. One of the most prideful things that I remember doing several times was showing her fifth grade scrapbook to groups of young people to break down the idea that history happens out there. That the line separating a, a fifth grade Maya Angelou and a fifth grader standing in the Schomburg looking through a glass case at her work virtually doesn't exist because the possibilities for greatness in making a contribution to the world, whether it's through poetry, through dance, through politics, is simply seeing oneself reflected as a, as a person who matters. And that, when you say, what is this crisis? What is this crisis is that the raw materials of those legacies will be lost if people don't not only invest in, in preserving their own material, but invest in institutions like history makers to make sure that what history makers is already doing continues to happen with the resources that it needs. That is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a crisis of black collections. And I, I just add that um, those who reached a certain elite status, um, I, I'll, I'll probably be accused of, of something. But in any event, 
those who've reached a certain elite status have embraced the uh, collection of African-American art. And African-American art uh, carries with it a certain level of status and all the rest of that, that uh, is conveyed upon the collector. Um, the raw materials, the archives and that kind of thing doesn't have that same kind of, I'll call it cachet. Um, uh, you, you, you don't have uh, a, a, a few people who are serious collector will have uh, original manuscripts of um, something by Malcolm X, et cetera, which they will actually have displayed in their house or in their office, et cetera. But for the most part, that kind of material isn't perceived as being uh, as status raising as collecting the art. And, uh, and, and, and what we need to be able to convey to those who are of, of different levels of economic capability is this notion that um, beyond what it does for you is a value that uh, is conveyed to not just our generation living now, but everyone that's come before um, in those historical records. And we have a, um, they did what they could to preserve what they could and to convey to us what they could about their experience and their past. We have an obligation to do that for future generations, um, um, dealing with all of that accumulated past up to this present time. And um, we're, we're, we're not there. We're not there yet. We, our, our, um, um, uh, our leadership is not there yet. Um, but because so much history is happening on the streets of America today, we may have an opportunity to get that message to a larger public. And I think uh, that's um, you know, hopefully one of the things that this um, forum will help to do. Well, if not now, when? Because we only have, I mean, if we started today, it will take us 10 years to make it in, at a rapid pace. And I want, I want to address some of this issue because Howard, you have told me on several occasions that I suffer from dreaming big. And, um, and I really want the organization now in this stage to become the digital repository for the black experience because I was factoring in, we have interviewed almost 3,400 people in 413 cities and towns across the United States. That's from 38 states. And um, from the ages of 36, when they were interviewed to 109. Of that, I mean, I can think of on my, you know, I was trying to calculate, I only know about 50 people that I know of that have any kind of repository or even thought about that. And what I think about a lot of times is these are the same people that some of them that have written books, uh, they go and promote their books. They are proud of their books and they make no plans for the repository. So in many ways, it's almost like they're taking each page of that out of their book and they're tearing apart the book. And then before they die, they light a fire to it to make sure that no one will know what they did. And that's what we are essentially doing. And, and the thing is, is that when I first started, I was told that, you know, when I said that I had to raise 30 million, people thought even close, uh, you know, that that was a pipe dream. The collection has cost us 30 million. That was no pipe dream. And what I'm talking about right now, like if we took each of our history makers and said, give us 20 boxes, that would be about 400 million required. So where is that money coming from? I'm asking both of you. Well, I, I, I'm going to uh, uh, say two things. The first one, um, you can simply declare that you are the digital archive of Black America. That, that's a fact. <laughs> That is not something that you, you that's not aspirational anymore. <laughs> that, 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 that's realized, that, 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 that's a fact. The, the, the second piece is that um, um, 
I've been one to um, always try to raise money, my, raise my own money to do what needs to be done. I've always been that way, but at the same time, I've never been prepared to let um, the state, if you will, off the hook. Uh, all of these other mainstream uh, museums, cultural centers, libraries, all of these things are funded with public money, with your tax dollars. And um, uh, we were successful uh, at, um, in, in, in the city of New York um, we were successful uh, at one level in the, uh, the, uh, the state of New York. And we were very successful actually, actually at the National Endowment for the Humanities, not at that level of money, but uh, with, um, I, I, we didn't have a year in my 27 years at the Schomburg where we did not have at least one NEH grant. And usually it was two or three. Um, why? Because it was public money. We had a right to it, uh, just like every one of our other institutions. Same thing true of the National Endowment for the Arts. We have a right to that. And, and if the city of New York or the city of Chicago or the state of Illinois or the state of uh, California is doing any kind of investment of money in cultural institutions, libraries, et cetera, uh, some percentage of that needs to find its way into supporting African-American and African diaspora uh, concerns. Uh, and the, the, the kind of campaign for that um, may in fact rest in this moment when um, um, the, uh, I say the, the, the racial justice thing is, is, is hot, if you will. Um, with monies that have been allocated for certain kinds of, if you will, racial justice work. Um, this foundational racial justice work needs to be in the mix and in the formula. And uh, to some extent, uh, if you're able to leverage the public money, you enhance your pro probability of being able to leverage private money. So strategically, I'd be, I'd be thinking in those terms. Um, we have, that, that's one. Number two, most of our organizations, um, and, and, and it's true of museums and libraries, continue to function um, as um, uh, competitive entities with each other. And this, uh, uh, the, the task that we have before us is one that uh, even taken collectively, we're not yet able to do. And we're not maximizing what we, we currently have and what we're able to get access to because we're fighting with each other over uh, the same collection or the same books or the same food and, uh, and, and fighting with each other, driving the damn price up, which is, is, is kind of stupid. <laughs> so. Uh, we who are in the field need to find ways of, um, I would call it developing some kind of uh, um, national collection development strategy that is divvied up among the various um, parts of our network of our ecosystem and um, is um, approached not on an individual basis, but on a group basis. Um, to ensure that um, A, we're able to maximize what we uh, are able to raise A, and B, to make sure that we're not uh, wasting money through these uh, false competitions. Uh, that's, that's my best judgment uh, at, at this stage. And it's not something, it's not the first time that I've said it, but, and it's not the first time that the idea has been put out there, but our, um, I'll just say this, uh, I, uh, one of my last uh, large scale projects was trying to um, build an archive, a, a, a digital archive uh, of the records of the historically black colleges. 
and um, worked with uh, UNCF, put together a proposal, got right to the door. And um, let's just say that some folk in the HBCU establishment um, were concerned that it might be taking place outside of the HBCU establishment. And therefore, it shouldn't happen. It's those, it's those um, you know, those traps or things that can get in people's way. What about you, Khalil? Well, I, I don't have a lot more to, to, to add uh, in terms of how Howard just described some of what can happen, both with public support and uh, you know, local officials in a place like Chicago or the state of Illinois where History Makers is incorporated. Um, or federal money coming from the NEH. I mean, uh, I think Howard is absolutely right. History makers ought to own um, its uh, success in becoming the largest digital repository for oral history, um, and in particular video history, uh, video captured oral histories. And, uh, and then the next phase of this being to uh, expand the possibilities of how those stories move into the future and what we learn from those stories uh, by adding the paper uh, and other materials that accompany those, those interviews. It's really not that complicated. I think that, uh, again, this is partly a political problem both within our community as Howard has so well articulated in the HBCU example, and also the structural racist inequalities uh, that make it difficult uh, for black people to overcome um, the financial costs when it comes to digitization and other things. Those costs are market driven um, and there's a 10 times wealth gap. And so even if we rallied all black people together to do this work, there would still be some structural challenges. I think we can do a whole lot better. I think we could probably solve 70% of this problem if more black people simply invested in this work and in, in the infrastructure that you're helping to build. And I hope that one of the things that comes out of this conversation is that. But let me just add one more sense of moral outrage and political urgency. Uh, I've already talked about the relationship of black people, their vision, their ideas, their history and democracy. But let me mention one more angle on this, which is to say that black people over index in every form of cultural production this country has ever produced, uh, both as targets of racist caricature in the first movies that were ever made from Birth of a Nation to the jazz singer, as well as to the ongoing ways in which black people make billions of dollars for industries from entertainment to sports. And so there's something about the commodification of black culture that shapes and defines so much of American culture. And yet when it comes to the infrastructure to support cultural production itself, not the consumption of it, but the production of it, that's when things fall apart. And so I think black people are gonna have to take ownership of leading this effort to invest in that infrastructure. And if white elites come along, great. If they don't, we know that we will have yet again risen to the challenge of supporting an organization like the History Makers, like Black folks have done for so long to support the Schomburg Center, like Black folks have done for a long time to support the DuSable Museum and other places that often survived by the hair on their chinny chin chin, but for a small number of people who step up. We gotta step up because the distance between what happened in the 1960s that we've been celebrating and what is happening now is gonna just grow longer and longer. And people are gonna look around and say, what just happened? And there's gonna be very little evidence to provide to show for it. So this is no joke, <laughs> it's serious even collecting the stories of post-civil rights activism. Some of what I did at Schomburg from hip hop to looking at LDF collections of people who were fighting the backlash that we now call mass incarceration or the Southern strategy, because our history doesn't just stop with black first showing up on Wall Street in the 1970s and 80s. It also continued with ongoing chapters being written after we so-called arrived. And so, I just want to add to what Howard just said by putting a little bit of fire in the belly of people because this is very real and we will look up in 25 and 30 years and, and realize that we run out of we run out of lessons to teach stories to be taught 
uh, books to celebrate. I mean, I had to explain once to a library administrator at the New York Public Library, I said, listen, you wanna cut the budget on curation and the research libraries. Uh, you wanna focus on teaching and, 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 and the, what happens in the branch activities. I don't think these are a trade-off. I think it's a both and, but what was being proposed was a trade-off. Less on the research side, more on the mass education side. And I said, okay, that's fine. But I said, how do you think the textbooks get written? How do you think bestsellers that people write, the cultural producers, the uh, Chimamanda Adichie or the Colin, Colson Whiteheads, you know, where do they get their material from to tell those stories? How does 12 Years a Slave get made? People go back to the archives. And so if you are, you know, uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face, then one day you're gonna look up and the textbooks will have, be saying the exact same thing they said 50 years before. The novels and, and, and literature will be canonized as if it stopped in 1970 and nothing came after it. I mean, it's, it's all so obvious when you take a step back. And the pressure on us to give up our archives um, in exchange for other people's archives, I think is, is what made me very frustrated in my time uh, leading the Schomburg Center. And I think folks like me out there are probably facing some of these same challenges. The humanities more generally has been under assault in terms of federal funding cut by 50%, according to the Academy of Arts and, uh, and Letters. So, so, so this problem is big, but black people often bear the disproportionate burden on it, of it. And yet we, black folk, have to step up and do more to invest in our own infrastructure. I'll just share this with you. Um, this was before you came, uh, Carl, Carl, you know, in my, I think probably the last three or four years of my tenure at, at the Schomburg. I was in one of these um, New York consortium groupings. And um, the question of collecting African-American stuff came up. And um, the person who was the um, director of collections for the New York Public Library sat in the room and said, in effect, that Columbia and um, NYU, and she named two or three others, um, could uh, collect the black stuff, um, we need to focus on our more general collections. Yeah. And I, 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 went, I had that same conversation <laughs> not long I went, after you. I went through the, I mean, and, 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 and basically, um, virtually every place that she named, this was their first decade of dealing with black stuff in any uh, any way at all. Um, but when they decide that it's time for them to get into it, their assumption is that they have the right and the authority to take command of the activity and be the determiner, the judges, on what's significant and what's not. Um, that's that's that that's one piece which um, I, and and it, and it's been. And as soon as uh, a mainstream institution comes into the marketplace, um, there's an assumption that there's no longer a need for a black institution to be concerned about that. And uh, the consequences of that, you mentioned earlier on, uh, Juliana, um, they think that jazz is white music. And they think that the blues is white music. And everybody that controls the blues and jazz in America and quite frankly across Europe is likely not black folk, except as artists, as performers. All the economics, the journals, everything that is the controlling apparatus uh, is now owned by some white entity. Um, and um, that's the way they think it should be. I, I want to thank both of you for this wonderful, wonderful um, conversation. Um, both of you, I have the greatest respect for you. Your minds are brilliant and your support of us has been really unparalleled. And um, Howard, I think back about when I was 
just thinking and, you know, timid in your in that conference room that I later came and met uh, Khalil at, you know, that you blessed the project at that time. But I'm going to ask both of you today to stay by our side and and help us move starting now and moving into 2021 um, to really do what we said is possible to do today. And to our audience, um, added to uh, the facts that, um, that you have heard our panelists uh, provide today, the largest group studying Black history also are young white females. And I say this, that there, we, we welcome everybody in to study our history, but to the Black community, I ask you to, to really, at this point, we have to take this seriously. We have just experienced what some people would call an apocalypse, almost. And we have no documentary evidence or very little documentary evidence of our value. So what is being discussed right now in society is who has value and who doesn't have value. And that can be determined by who takes the time to really document what they have. We have the documentation. We just have to make sure we don't throw it away upon our death and dying. So we have to take seriously that we will take care of our legacy as we would our will and that we will move forward. We have the opportunity here to save huge amounts of what we have accomplished um, in and made a part of both a part of American society, but also outside the United States. And so I welcome all of you to get on our bandwagon and help us do and continue to do what no one in the history of the United States has done. That will be with your dollars and your support and also strategizing and make it work. We will have to have a modern day works project administration, but let's have fun with it. We have our advisory committees. Uh, we have thinking going on. We've had a lot of brainstorming going on. And I believe solidly that we will be able to move forward. And I wanna thank Howard Dodson and Khalil Muhammad and those of you who have taken a, chance, a time to listen to us today, thank you very much. There's a crisis out here and we're gonna solve it. And let me just say too, before we go, that um, each and every one of you, African-Americans, is a history maker. Each and every one of you. Um, and it's because of the history you make every day that we as a group make history. And um, that's, um, if we're doing our job responsibly, what shows up in the archive will reflect that reality. And we can't reflect that reality without um, a conscious commitment on all of our parts that um, not just that we have value, but that we, uh, through our living and being, have a um, significant impact on ourselves, on our nation, and on the world. And that truth should never be lost to any generation. So uh, I'll stop there. I've been a pleasure to be here with the two of you. And um, I trust that um, the people who are out there watching, um, hope, trust we said something that'll get you to um, act. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Juliana. It's a pleasure to be a part of this. Yes, thank you. Thank you.